Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Um, Samuel Anderson Anderson hasn't seen his mother in decades. Not since that summer of 1988 when she woke him one morning, said, don't be afraid anymore, then walked out of his bedroom, out of the family home and out of Samuel's life. Now it's 2011 and there she is again. On every screen of every television, the perpetrator of an absurd act of polit political violence against a state governor. When Samuel is asked to act as a character witness at her trial and agrees for reasons not entirely pure, a far-reaching investigation into his mother's story begins. Ranging back and forth between the student protests of 1968, the twilight of the Reagan era and 2011, as the United States was still reeling from the financial crash of a few years earlier, the Knicks is not just the intimate portrait of a family, but also of a nation. Of the choices we face, of the mistakes we make, of the way we see ourselves and of the ghosts that haunt us. Turning his sights on everything from politicians, the media, video gaming, protest movements, university administration and even the book industry, Nathan Hill's talent for telling a complex, engaging, formally inventive and humane story is matched only by his gift for language. No page goes by without a sentence or two you just want to read again and wallow in. Profound, but profoundly funny too. The Knicks sets the bar at great American novel height and clears it easily. Nathan Hill's short stories have appeared in many literary journals, including the Iowa Review, AGNI, the Gettysburg Review and Fiction, where he was awarded the annual Fiction Prize. Originally from Iowa, he now lives with his wife in Naples, Florida. The Knicks is his first novel. The Washington Post said readers would be dazzled, and the New York Times called The Knicks hugely entertaining and unfailingly smart. Well, the great John Irving called Nathan Hill the best new writer of fiction in America. The best. Please join me in welcoming him to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's no way I can possibly live up to that. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, well, let's see. We've got, a, <laughs> we've got an hour for you to prove John Irving right. Oh, great. <laughs> um, okay, well, I guess... What I'd like to begin by talking about is the the origins of the book because the Nix it's a it's a big book and <laughs> it's a, about what, 600 pages long. It ranges over decades. It it takes us into the um, the, the the backstory of, of plenty of different characters. Um, but I can only imagine there must have been a seed. There must have been something which one a first idea, a first image, a first thought that that gave rise to the Knicks. Uh, it's 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 funny. I I never intended to write this book, and and when I did start writing this book, I intended it for be uh, to be kind of hilariously a short story, uh, so that this <laughs> happened was it was a great surprise. Um, I guess the first spark happened in in two thousand four. I had just finished uh, university, and I uh, and I moved to New York City, which was a long kind of dream of mine. I grew up in the suburbs and small towns of the Midwest in the U.S., and I'd always wanted to like be a writer in New York City. That was it for me. Uh, and so in 2004, I did that. I finished school, and so I moved to New York. And my first apartment in New York was this one-month sublet in Queens. Uh, it was like a staging ground for me uh, while I, I hunted for more permanent uh, apartment. And I shared it with, like eight, nine, ten guys who all worked for like road construction crew uh, who, yeah, they had, yeah, yeah, I won't even tell you about the state of the bathroom in that place. Um, uh, they would all like go to work and then come back home at the end of the day and like uh, change into usually their underwear actually oddly and like eat hot dogs and play Call of Duty the rest of the day in the, in the living room. So it was a very strange place to live. Um, and uh, so I wasn't in the, in the apartment all that much that, that first month. This was August of 2004 um, and I was kind of exploring the city you know, I was, I was, I was new to New York and I was trying to enjoy it. And one of the things that happened while I was there was that uh, the Republican Party was having their presidential nominating convention at Madison Square Garden. Uh, so this was Bush Cheney's second term, uh, and the war in Iraq was ongoing, and a lot of people came to protest that event. And so I thought that's going to be a pretty cool thing to see. So I went down to watch the protests. Um, and I did. Anyway, so uh, fast forward to the end of the month, I am. I found a new apartment. It's moving day, but there's this awkward thing where I have to be out of my sublet in the morning, but I can't move into my other apartment until the evening. And so I put everything into my car. I go to work. I come back to move into my new apartment and find that the car is empty. Everything's been stolen, including the computer on which I'd written everything in my in my master's program. So, <laughs> like, yeah, like three years of writing was just gone, you know, and like a, a like a novel in progress, and like oh, they, you know, and then you you ask me, did you back it up? And I say, yes, I did on <laughs> on CDs that were right next to the computer, so they were <laughs> they were stolen too. So 
I was very sad for a while, and then eventually I was just like, I have to start writing again. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to keep writing what I had been writing, because it was just it was just too depressing. So I was like, I don't know, I'll just write about the most interesting thing I've seen lately, and that was the protests at the RNC. So I started this, what I thought was going to be a short story, about somebody uh, involved in those protests, and then it just kind of kept going and mm. going and going. I didn't know it at the time, but that, that was the, the, the first lines that mm. ended up being part of the Knicks. And... It's interesting because you say uh, you went to, to New York, the dream of living in New York, dream of being a writer. And of course, the dream of being a writer was something shared by Samuel, our mm -hmm. protagonist. Um, and of course, I, th I think it's, there's always a temptation. I think it's often wrong when you um, when you read a book and the, the, the main character is a writer to, you know, and particularly in, 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 uh, in this case, it's a writer approximately your generation and uh, to kind of want to to, to draw parallels let's mm -hmm. say um, but let's let's talk a little bit about Samuel let's sort of unpick his character and let's um, maybe make the, <laughs> the distinctions between you and him so when we when we meet Samuel it, in 2011 he's um, he's a teacher in fact but um, but a teacher with writing ambitions could you just uh, fill us in a little bit on sure this? yeah we meet him uh, he's he, he teaches literature at a small suburban uh, 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 Chicago uh, suburbs of Chicago uh, University. Um, he really he's really sour about his students. Like he really dislikes them quite a lot. He kind of resents them. Um, he uh, he teaches literature. Most of his students are are um, looking at their phones for the entire class, and he kind of can't get through to them. Um, and and he goes home at the end of the night and usually plays this video game called World of Elfscape, which I transparently modeled on the on the actual <laughs> real game uh, World of Warcraft. If any of you are in, uh, know that game, no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay it's cool uh and uh it won't ruin your no no you can novel. still enjoy the book if you don't know um uh, yeah writing about video games was a really like i uh, i was like looking for uh, around for like permission to do it because i'm like i've never re read anybody who writes about video games in, in this way and and, I, and 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 i recognize that like for people of a certain generation which is like anybody older than like 26 now um uh maybe the only thing more boring than watching somebody play video games is reading about somebody <laughs> playing video games. So I was like very, it was, it was very, I didn't, didn't know if I could write about that, but I ended up just going for it anyway. Uh, that's a different story. Sorry. Um, and, uh, and Samuel, um, is mostly, he's playing this, these games. He's, uh, hating his, his, uh, his teaching career. Um, he has one student who's a real challenge to him, uh, and who was probably going to get him fired. Uh, and he, Every once in a while, kind of Googles uh, this 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 woman that's kind of the love of his life, but they're they're very much estranged, mm -hmm. and that's where we find him uh, in, in the in the opening chapters. And it's funny because I think when we when we first meet Samuel. Um, I, I wouldn't say, yeah, he's not necessarily the most sympathetic character. We kind of, there, there, are, there are things, uh, you know, quite, quite amusing, quite charming about him, but also, yeah, some of his, uh, he seems quite embittered. He seems quite, um, uh, yeah, quite cynical, I guess, about where he finds himself in life. But then when we are later introduced to, um, to Samuel as a, as a small boy, um, at least I found as a reader, I just found him sort of, achingly sympathetic in fact i mean like really there there are moments where i mean he's a he's a, he's a very sensitive child um he has he he weeps a lot of it i mean as even as a even as a grown man he, he has a tendency to weep um and and i think yeah sort of as soon as we start getting into his childhood we suddenly discover what brought him to this uh, this slightly embittered slightly um cynical character yeah, I was hoping that, uh, actually I was hoping for most of the characters in the book that you would have a, a first impression of them that was then undermined by reading the rest of the book. Um, uh, the, the, the book begins with a headline, um, uh, Samuel's mother, Faye, uh, commits this really weird uh, crime. She throws gravel at a, at a, at a ultra-conservative Republican presidential candidate, um, and it's like captured online, and it's like becomes kind of viral, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Samuel hasn't seen her for 20 years. She walked out on, on him and his dad when, when he was 11 years old so this is very surprising to him and and so you know uh, everybody makes a certain judgment about what this woman is throwing throwing why, why this woman is throwing gravel which then of course the next 600 pages works mm -hmm. to undo and similarly uh yeah samuel is kind of a bitter 
kind of calloused guy but then we we flash back to when he's 11 and you realize that a lot of that bitterness is just a facade because underneath like his emotions are so big that he's almost he's always about to break into some kind of crying fest like he's about some weeping jag is always like really close to the surface and so he has to like try really hard spend a lot of emotional energy kind of mm. keeping that at bay um um and uh, and then of course you learn all the reasons why mm. that might be true for him mm. so um yeah i'm hoping he becomes more sympathetic and it's, it's funny just to, to linger on the, the the weeping a little bit because <laughs> when i was reading I, I did think you know it is it's relatively rare to to find uh let's say heroes of a book and of course you know samuel's not a hero in perhaps the you know straightforward sense but certainly you know the principal protagonist and we spend a lot of time with him who's sort of so open about the possibility of a boy and then a man being kind of overcome with uh, with weeping fits and and i could think of and this, I, I don't know if this is a comparison at all, but I, uh, I can think of Odysseus, weirdly, in the Odyssey. I mean, he, he's crying all the time. Um, I can think of, actually, the books on the shelf just behind you of uh, Knausgaard, again, is someone very prone to weeping. But they were the only two examples um, I could think of. Um, and I think, in a way, it says quite a lot about the, the kind of, let's say, male heroes of books we're often presented with. And I was just wondering, was it sort of was it an intention of yours to kind of to undermine in a sense this kind of the 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 idea of what uh, a main character what a hero of a novel should be i don't know if i was that that um uh purposeful about mm -hmm. it uh i i think uh, rather I, I i i thought that it worked as a nice dynamic between him and another 11 year old that he meets when he's uh, a child uh this guy by the name of bishop who is the opposite of him he's bishop is a brash kind of like um doesn't take any crap from anybody kind of a um uh he's the, like the kid i wish i could have been when i was in grade school you know i i followed all the rules and i wanted to please my teachers but I, but I, I saw kids who were just like whatever i don't care and like they would do whatever they wanted and i was always kind of jealous of that you know so i made a character who could do that um and and so i liked the the kind of strength of that character and the kind of brittleness of samuel together um but even that like came to me much later honestly and this is this is why i enjoy writing so much and also why it takes me so long which is i don't i never know what's going to happen um when i sit down to write i don't plan things out i don't do like character sketches um i don't do outlines uh, because when i do i find that they're shallow and and boring frankly uh, and so i i i sit down and what i'm really trying to do is surprise myself and, and entertain myself in the chair like if i figure if i if i figure that if i'm surprised and i'm entertained mm -hmm. then the readers will be too mm -hmm. so that 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 crying stuff came along because one day i was writing uh, a section of samuel when he was 11 years old and um i live in florida and we were under a hurricane watch and i just wrote this 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 section about um uh, how how his cry he he cries a lot and um, he and the counselor at school have uh, different categories like a taxonomy of of weeping um, what a what a category one cry feels like what a category two cry feels like what a category three and so I started I started defining these things only because in the moment that felt really funny um, and uh, but then these things these nice things happen where it's like something presents itself and then you realize it it sort of has this magnetic attraction to other things in the book and suddenly it felt right. So so I kept it. Um, and so that's really how it came out. Like, mm -hmm. I just had a neat idea one day yeah. and then went with it. That's it's quite fascinating, actually, to hear that you sort of, you, you like to be surprised and you sort of, uh, you see where the writing takes you. Because one of the, one of the reasons I think the Knicks works so well is the way that sort of the, the story or the, the past, particularly of Faye, is sort of, is so slowly, but also so neatly unpacked. I mean, there's lots of, um, there's lots of things which perhaps don't make a lot of sense uh, at the beginning. We sort of, well, hang on, why, you know, why did she, at, at this point she was at a student protest and then at this point she was suddenly back and she was uh, setting up a family. Sort of this doesn't really make a great deal of sense. And so that sort of, that, that sort of arc, let's say, of sort of a phase, uh, a, a phase life, a phase journey, was that something which again came to you quite... Uh, quite slowly, didn't yeah, it, right? it did, and it, it also helped that it took so long to write the book. It, it, like, so I started writing it in 2004, and I submitted it to uh, my agent in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and oh. yeah, yeah, and and in the in those ten years, you know, I went from 26 to 36, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and 
or so, uh, and <laughs> and you're 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 a very different person at those ages, you know. And and you know, like when I started writing the book, I was this like super ambitious writer in New York City. I was going to go conquer the world. And by 36, I was like happily married, you know, and like I was a teacher and really happy with that, and and really and hadn't published a book and kind of had given up on 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 those dreams. I was a radically different person, um, and that kind of interested me, like how 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 uh, a person can ha inhabit one body but feel so different uh, you know in in different parts of their lives there's a line in the, in the novel that says something like um uh 80 about what you believe about yourself when you're 20 turns out to be wrong mm -hmm. but the challenge is figuring out what your small true part is uh and uh, and so that that kind of became um a, a theme that that worked for Faye especially um uh, other characters to a lesser degree but Faye especially like she thought she was someone mm -hmm. she had an idea of herself when she was 18 years old just like i did i was going to be a writer in new york city and then that idea collapsed and so what do you do then yeah well, let's let's talk a little bit about Faye then, because you so you've mentioned that the sort of the, our first encounter with her is this kind of quite absurdist uh, political gesture, the handful of gravel in the in the face of the uh, uh, the governor. But obviously, we we know there's much more to her than that. She she had a family. We know she's Samuel's mother. We know very early on that at a certain moment she she walked out on the family. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, could you just maybe just introduce us a little bit to to Faye and how that character came to you uh, she came very slowly because she's I, I think i see the novel through samuel's eyes and and she's a big mystery to samuel and thus she was kind of a mystery to me too for a very long time um in fact the only reason i went to write about her 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 childhood and 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 growing up where she did in rural iowa in 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 the the mid to late 60s uh, was that i needed to get to know her better um and it wasn't until i started filling in those pieces that she she kind of came together that uh, she had a she had a, a father who had immigrated from uh, from Norway to Iowa, um, who had been a fisherman and now worked in a factory, um, and uh, and that she was spending her 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 school year, her uh, her final school year in high school, trying to figure out if she wanted to leave town or not, if she wanted to uh, uh, to take this scholarship um, uh, as the the first woman to ever get a scholarship in her high school. Um, suddenly, it kind of placed her in this different category in town, um, and this is something that that. that I experienced as well uh, surprisingly like I grew up in small towns my family's from a small midwestern town and there's this feeling that was very unexpected when I was like I'm gonna move to New York City there was this there was this sudden kind of resentment from back home like oh you think you're better than us mm -hmm. you know that kind of feeling and 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 it was really hard to navigate and it came as a big shock to me so I, I, I gave that to Faye you mm -hmm. know um, and so suddenly she has to make this choice is she going to kind of abandon her hometown um uh for this thing that she really wants or is she going to um do what everybody wants of her and, and stay put and mm -hmm. start and start a family and so that 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 drama suddenly gave mm -hmm. life to her story which seems like a perfect moment to uh to have a short reading uh from sure. you so um because this is going well I'll, I'll let you i'll let you contextualize it but this this happens in in the 1988 section. Samuel, as an 11 year old, is talking to his mother, and uh, and this this is the little section that explains the title. Samuel's mother told him about the Nix, another of her father's ghosts, the scariest one. The Nix, she said, was a spirit of the water who flew up and down the coastline looking for children, especially adventurous children out walking alone. When it found one, the Nix would appear to the child as a large white horse. Unsaddled but friendly and tame, it bowed down as low as a horse was able so the kid could leap onto it. At first the children were afraid, but ultimately how could they refuse? Their very own horse. They jumped on, and when it stood up again, they were eight feet off the ground and they were delighted. Nothing this big had ever minded them before. They became bold. They would kick at the horse to go faster, and so it broke into a light trot, and the more the kids loved it, the faster the horse would go. Then they wanted other people to see them. They wanted their friends to stare with envy at this brand new horse, their horse. It always went like this. The kids who were victims of the Knicks always felt at first fear, then luck, then possession, then pride, then terror. They'd kick at the horse to go faster until it was in a full gallop, the kids hanging onto its neck. It was the best thing that had ever happened to them. They'd never felt so important, so full of pleasure. 
and only at this point, at the pinnacle of speed and joy, when they felt most in control of the horse, when they felt the most ownership of it, when they most wanted to be celebrated for it, and thus felt the most vanity and arrogance and pride, would the horse veer off the road that led to town and gallop toward the cliffs overlooking the sea. It ran full bore toward that great drop into the violent churning water below, and the kids screamed and yanked back on the horse's mane and cried and wailed, but nothing mattered. The horse leaped off the cliff and dropped. The children clung to its neck even as they fell, and if they weren't bashed to death on the rocks, they drowned in the frigid water. This was a story Faye had heard from her father. All her ghost stories came from Grandpa Frank, who was a tall and thin and intensely withdrawn man with a perplexing accent. Most people found him intimidating in his silence, but Samuel always thought it was a relief. Whenever they visited him in Iowa on those rare Thanksgivings or Christmases, the family would sit around the table eating and not saying a word. It was hard to have a conversation when it was met only with a nod of his head, a dismissive, hmm. Mostly they ate their turkey until Grandpa Frank was finished eating and left to watch television in the other room. The only time Grandpa Frank was ever really animated was when he told them stories of the old country, old myths, old legends, old tales about ghosts he'd heard growing up where he'd grown up in the far north, in far north Norway, in a little fishing village in the Arctic that he left when he was 18. When he told Faye about the Nicks, he said the moral was, don't trust things that are too good to be true. But then she grew up and came to a new conclusion, which she told Samuel in the month before leaving the family. She told him the same story, but added her own moral. The things you love the most will one day hurt you the worst. Samuel didn't understand. The Nix doesn't appear as a horse anymore, she said. They were in the kitchen hope, uh, hoping for a break in the heat wave that now seemed endless, sitting there reading with the refrigerator door wide open and a fan blowing cold air onto them, drinking ice water, glasses sweating wet circles on the table. The Nix used to appear as a horse, she said, but that was in the old days. What does it look like now? It's different for everyone, but it usually appears as a person. Usually it's someone you think you love. Samuel did not understand. People love each other for many reasons, not all of them good, she said. They love each other because it's easy, or because they're used to it, or because they've given up, or because they're scared. People can be a nix for each other. Thank you. Thank you. Those two, um, those two morals, so... Um the uh, uh, don't trust things that are too good to be true and the things you love the most will one day hurt you the worst. Um, I guess that brings us quite neatly on to talking about the sort of the, the representation of the United States um, in, um, in this novel. Now, a moment ago you said you started working on it in 2004, um, but interestingly a big part of the novel takes place in 2011 mm -hmm. so sort of post like three years after the massive financial crash and all of the all of the consequences of that um and when I, when i was reading it i i thought there se seemed to be a certain rhyme if you like between the three epochs of the book uh 1968 1988 and then um and then 2011 mm -hmm. um did you did did you choose those uh, epochs for that particular reason because you saw these kind of parallels or was that sort of or were these parallels something that came out during the writing yeah no i did uh, pick them for that that reason you're right there is there's a rhyme to it uh i um so the nicks became a very tidy um metaphor for what was happening in the book not only for the because of the characters you know the characters are undone by the very things that mean the most to them um uh samuel is of, of course abandoned by his mother but uh, uh his 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 childhood crush bethany is uh is um kind of disowned by her own twin brother um his father henry uh is a workaholic who's un who's undone by the very company he's uh, been working for um there's a uh, there's a character who's addicted to video games who's undone by the very video game that gives his life meaning uh the, the college student is undone by the very uh devices that that she loves so much so i, I kind of realized this thing was happening to all of my characters like the more they loved something the more it kind of injured them in return um and then also not to be too pointy headed about it but this was something i was observing as i was writing a lot of this material between 2008 and 2011 um uh when we had a a, a recession that was um in some ways made worse because of our faith and things we thought were were risk fee with risk free um things like um you know uh uh, what uh, mortgage-based securities, AAA rated, sovereign debt, things like that. The 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 um the the recession became a systemic problem because we thought, well, these things they're, they're, 
they'll never go down, you know, uh, and uh, and there's no risk there. So it felt true, sort of. In a, in a larger sense and also felt true in the smaller sense between my characters so that's when I, I kind of pursued pursued that idea more and, 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 and that's where it led me mm -hmm. and, and this this, um, this idea that sort of yeah the different characters are sort of being brought down uh, in the same way I think some of the um, I, I don't want to call them set pieces because that makes it sound like they're not particularly integrated but certain of the characters so like for example Laura Potsdam the, the student or um, uh, Periwinkle, I forget his first name. The guy, the guy Periwinkle. <laughs> um, the uh, these are kind of there. There are moments of of which where, where it feels very much like uh, a direct satire of of the society. So, um, well, maybe let's begin with uh, with Laura. Yeah. Um, so Laura is one of uh, Samuel's students, the one you mentioned earlier, who he's having problems with and who could be um, could be getting him fired in a way. And uh, it felt like you, firstly, that you were having a lot of fun. Uh, writing uh, Laura's character, and now having heard that you you were a teacher, it makes me wonder if uh, <laughs> if you were okay. enjoying uh, yeah. grinding a certain. I, I if I ever I it's it's funny if I ever if I ever apply for a teaching job <laughs> again, I feel like I'm never gonna have a chance because people have re read this book and Samuel seems so sour about it. I liked teaching, I really did, but that doesn't make for very good drama, you know. Somebody really <laughs> really liking their job, um, and it's true that I did have um, certain very challenging moments with students. Um, uh, uh, I should say that most of my students that every, everywhere I've taught have been hardworking and wonderful people, but there were enough uh, like Laura Potsdams uh, that that I don't know. Um, I would I would talk to my friends who also were in in the in the industry, and we all had the same stories. Uh, uh, students who would you know plagiarize papers, cheat on tests, uh, uh, you know uh, couldn't be bothered to look up from their phones in class, and then kind of blamed the teacher for for it, you know. And then, like I had a student. All right, uh, I will I will tell you two stories. I don't know. <laughs> I will tell you two stories. Uh, uh, one the first story is like one of the first classes I ever taught. I uh, I, I went into my first class. And there's 25 students in the class, and I taught taught my class. It's like a first year writing class, you know, um, how to write an essay in college, that that kind of class. And uh, and so then a couple of days later, I came in for the second class, and of the 25 students, 21 remained, which as I learned was a pretty good ratio. They like shop around. So um, and then of the four people who didn't show up, three of them eventually dropped the class, and so they disappeared from my online role. But one name stayed on my online role, and I kept waiting for her to drop the class, and she never did. And I and eventually kind of forgot about it and I taught the whole semester and then the last class before finals week the last class of the semester I go in to teach my class and there's this new person I was like hi what are you doing here and she says this name and it's the name from the role now she hasn't been there since the first class and it's now the last class so she's missed three and a half months and uh and I say welcome back and then I like I I, te I teach my class um, and then she comes up to me at the end of class and she says and this is not a lie she says so I think I've fallen a little behind in your class <laughs> what extra credit can I do to get a good grade and I was like uh, well there's there's no, there's not enough like you missed the whole the whole thing you missed everything so um, I explained to her that, that like the school I was teaching I had this really nice policy with with regarding this one required class that if you failed it you could take it again the next semester and then whatever grade you got the next semester would replace the F and so I'm just like just take it next semester and show up you'll be fine and she's like you're, you're not gonna help me I'm like I, there's nothing I can do so she left and then and then on a hunch, two nights later, I checked this website, ratemyprofessors.com. Do does anybody know about this website? It's awful. It's like Yelp for teachers. And, uh, and, and, and sure enough, there was a brand new anonymous review of me that said, I asked this guy for help and he didn't help me. He's a jackass. And I was just like, so, that, so that experience, the second story is much shorter. The second story is um, I, I, I found a student who had um, copied and pasted a whole uh, essay uh, from a website. And, uh, and, and I, I found it because it's very easy to spot. Uh, and, uh, and so I asked her to come to my office. Yeah, and I asked her to come to my office and I uh, said okay here's the website here's your paper these things are identical can you explain this and she looked at me and she's like I don't know it's weird <laughs> <laughs> so like that happened a lot like there wasn't a semester that went by when I was a teacher and I taught for 10 years there wasn't a semester that went by when something like that didn't happen and so it just felt like there was something yeah it just felt like there was something really wrong uh, and so 
Laura Potsdam was sort of born first as a to kind of just got to get out certain frustrations of mine. Um, <laughs> but I realized pretty quickly that when I when when I was doing that, that she wasn't a full character. She was what's the fallacy? She was a straw man. You know, she was, was she was just someone for which I can just direct my anger. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's felt like there was authorial disdain for the character. And that's no fun. That's mm-hmm. pretty cruel to do. So eventually I started asking questions about about Laura. Why is she doing this? Why does she feel this way? What's happened in her life to uh, think that she is the good guy in the story? Because we all want to feel that we're the good guy in the story of our lives and we all we all feel like well you know occasionally that we're we're the david to the goliath that is the world so in what way does she feel this um and i started asking my my students about it and uh and i i, I came to a kind of conclusion about it which was that my students kind of at least in that era they 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 grow they had grown up during a recession where their teachers and their parents and their guidance counselors were telling them there is it's an incredibly competitive global economy you need to get good grades you need to um get a good job or get a get into a good school you know have a 4.0 gpa straight a's uh and uh and and get and in order to get a good job there's no room for failure Mm -hmm. and i know when i grew up you know i went to i went to school in the 90s and i know that like (laughs) if i got an f in a class i would just kind of take it on the chin and move on and and i was reasonably sure i'd get a job when i graduated and i did these kids did not have the same confidence and therefore between failing a paper and cheating and maybe getting caught but maybe Mm. getting in it getting you know good marks it seemed worth Mm. it and so they were just coming up at a different time so i started feeling a little more sympathy towards them and thus towards Mm. towards laura as well and that definitely does come out and i mean apart from the fact of course i think one of one of the other things that endears the reader to laura is her kind of just her jaw-dropping brazenness i mean that's kind of but seemingly quite realistic based on the anecdote you've just told us um but also it's the fact that yeah that these uh, particularly at that age they are kind of a very much a product well i guess we all are products of the era we grow up in of the kind of uh the ideas that are fed into us and i think uh, at least in the states i think a lot of people who are very well-meaning and love them nevertheless give them very bad advice that mm-hmm. like go to college and and do something that will make you a lot of money mm-hmm. do something that is essentially job training so Mm -hmm. forget about the humanities you know don't do that Mm -hmm. go into engineering accounting something that has a a direct and easy to see career path um and and thus like a lot of them just come to classes like mine where i try to teach them like appreciation of poetry and they're just like what this is unnecessary and so they don't they don't see it as important and Mm -hmm. and therefore it's pretty easy to just cheat Mm -hmm. on it because who cares you know um and and so and so yeah so a part of it is a product of that they're just Mm -hmm. getting a lot of bad advice from people Mm -hmm. i think and one of the things i think you deal with quite a lot in the next is the this idea of choice about how firstly how we make choices in our life but also if we really have choices at all in fact and that does to me seem to connect quite a bit to this kind of the concept of uh of the american dream essentially you know you you are free to 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 be what you want to be to do what you want to do you know and yet the characters in your in in your book whether it's Faye, whether it's samuel whether it's laura potsdam they're uh they're struggling against because of making choices in the face of what they've essentially been uh produced to uh to become and i think in that in that way the sort of the post-war uh moment of sort of you know great development and the sort of the the middle class american dream in a way mm-hmm. when we first in, in 1968 it's starting to turn a bit sour and then when we sort of when we were in 2011 with laura potsdam it seems to you know have gone completely completely off the rails yeah i, I think i think a lot of the characters have i have digested that that um that american dream mi- mythos mm-hmm. and uh and and part of part of the problem is that they didn't expect so much friction along the way mm-hmm. you know um and uh and 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 kind of figured well if i work hard i'll get what i want and that's just not how the world works certainly not how like late, late american capitalism works you know uh and uh, for example henry um uh, um uh samuel's father works for the same company his whole life um and he he grew up you know in the 60s and 70s during a time when you know you worked for a company they gave you a pension and that's the agreement and and suddenly it's 2011 and this company um uh bails out its shareholders and and henry loses his whole retirement which is exactly something that happened to my own father you know so it's a different era and it's almost like the 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 ground shifted beneath their feet while they weren't looking and so you have some people like henry and samuel and Faye and alice mm-hmm. um who, who think i can be anything i want to be and then um the world kind of roughs them mm-hmm. up a little bit and they're, they're, they're left like wondering like 
like what what happened you know yeah, like, yeah. is it my fault what what happened you know? and one of the sort of i think very formally inventive ways you play with the idea of choice is through a certain part of the book which is sort of structured around uh the choose your own adventure uh, type of do people know those books? Choose oh, yeah. your own adventure books. Do, do you know what these are? Some a lot of you do. Some of them you I don't. I grew up in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. I know exactly what <laughs> uh, whenever the bookmobile would come to my my school, I would always buy out the choose your own adventure books. They're kind of ga- if you don't know what I'm talking about, they're kind of game books um, where you know you you start the story. It's all written in second person. You are an explorer on the whatever uh, in the Serengeti, and do you want to? And then at the end of the page, it'll give you a choice. Do you want to do this or do you want to do that? If you want to do this, turn to page. 30. 37 if you want to do that turn to page 82 um and so then you do that and then and then it just branches and 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 instead of one story going through the book there are many stories many branches and each of them is a complete story and so there there are hundreds of ways through through the book um i loved these things when i was a kid um and so i gave them to samuel i have him um i have him uh reading them when he's a kid and then i had this one (laughs) this, this one section of the book where um, Samuel goes to New York to try to win the heart of this woman that he's in love with, and he fails miserably. Um, and I, I figured that he would, in in you know, at some point in the future, he would look pa- look back on that moment and think, if only I'd made different choices. If only I'd just done something a little different, I could have I could have gotten the girl. And uh, and I thought back to those moments when I was reading Choose Your Own Adventure books, and one of the things I always did, because I always thought there was one perfect way to get through the book, like one correct way, like the platonically perfect, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so whenever a hard choice would appear, I'd put my thumb in the thing and, like, f- look forward and, and look at what happens if I make that choice, and if I don't like it, I would go back and, like, take the other direction. Um, I, would, I figured that Samuel would maybe feel that way about this moment with this woman in New York, that maybe if he just made different choices, if he could just put his thumb in that moment and go back, maybe, maybe he could do it. And so because it felt sort of emotionally re- relevant, uh, I decided to write that whole section in second person as a choose-your-own-adventure. You are Samuel, and then you get to follow him through this adventure uh, in New York. Um, the, the hitch, of course, is that um, I actually don't give you any choices uh, <laughs> until, <laughs> until the very end where there's one choice, and it's a real doozy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I... Fear we're running out of time, and I've got plenty of things I would like to talk to you about. So, but in about a few minutes' time, I'll hand over to the audience. So, if you have a question for Nathan, we'll raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Um, what What am I going to finish? I, I guess um, I'd like to talk in that case about the 1968. Let's uh, go to that because, uh, of course, sort of 1988, you lived, and in fact, Samuel is more or less a contemporary of yours. And you know, you lived it as a, as a child. 2011, of course, but 1968 was uh an, an an area you had to research you had to get to know and um now i wasn't alive at that time so it's difficult for me to say it's authentic but it feels very authentic it feels meticulously researched um could you just talk a little bit about how you got your mind into that period sure yeah i i uh I started writing it because one of the things that all the like talking head type people on cable news uh, were saying in 2004 about the Republican convention, they were wondering if the demonstrations were going to be as violent as the demonstrations in 1968 in Chicago. Uh, if you don't know about that, uh, uh, that, there, that, that's where the Democratic National Convention was being held in 1968, and uh, a lot of people were showing up to protest. Uh, um, the Democrats were thinking about putting in a peace plank into their party platform, um, and the, their, that, that was very divisive, um, and, uh, and people were coming to to protest the the convention and protest the war um and um un, kind of unknowingly uh the, the, the protesters didn't know that this was going to happen but um uh the chicago's mayor at the time had kind of instructed the police force to handle these these folks pretty roughly and so um they did and uh you know there was uh, uh riots in the streets there was uh, you know uh, people getting hit with billy clubs uh, even press like photographers were getting their cameras smashed uh dan rather the tv personality famously got punched in the belly um uh and and on and on. In fact, the um, uh, the independent commission that, that researched it afterwards called it a police riot, um, and it was on television for a week. Uh, and so this was like a big kind of turning point in, in that era. And you're right, I didn't live through it. So um, I, I sort of asked my parents about it, and they're like, ah, we were young and we saw it on TV, and I don't know, they couldn't really help. And so I went to uh, went to Chicago and uh, and went to the the the, um, the, uh, the the Chicago History Museum Research Library, uh, where they have just boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff from the from convention week and from the whole summer from 1968 and then on into stu- stuff from 1969 the 
Summer of Rage, I think is what they called it. Um, and I just read and read and read and read. And then, and then I, I found every book I could about Chicago 68 and I read it all. Um, and I didn't even write any of that section for like three years. I, I, uh, my, my wife is a, is a musician. She's a classical musician. She has this phrase that, that I like. She says that she, she rehearses a piece until she has it under her fingers. Meaning that it's like she just, she doesn't have to think about the notes. It just kind of happens. Like it's part of the body instead of the mind. And so that's, I kind of feel that. I, I researched 1968 Chicago until I felt like I had it under my fingers, like where I could write about it with authority without having to consult all of these texts, you know? So I just kind of inhaled as much as I could for three years and then, and then, and then just did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't let it go without mentioning the, the cameo of an old friend of this bookstore, Alan Ginsberg. Uh, <laughs> well, Ginsberg was there in 68. Uh -huh. uh, and he, you know, it's funny. I wanted to put him in the book because I, I sort of, in my, my imagination, Alan Ginsberg is this kind of rabble rouser and this kind of troublemaker. Um, but in 68 in Chicago, he was actually trying to calm everybody down. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's YouTube footage of Ginsberg. Um, uh, well, it wasn't originally YouTube footage <laughs> of Ginsburg, uh, of Ginsburg um, in the park, uh, um, um, meditating and chanting, uh, just going om and like getting this whole circle of people around him to all just like sit down and chant and meditate and just be peaceful. Um, the thinking being like the police won't attack if we're just doing this, and 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 he was really like he was terrified of of the violence. He was terrified of of what might happen in Chicago, and he wrote it. He wrote about it in his journal. Uh, about about flying into Chicago, knowing what might happen, and 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 trying what he uh, trying trying to prevent it, knowing he probably couldn't, um, and so that because that just was kind of surprising to me, and really human, and really sweet. So I I I I just I was so moved by it that I decided to make him a character in the book. <laughs> now I could probably go on all night, but it is your turn now. If you have a question for Nathan, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear well oh, in that case it. we'll get that microphone to you <laughs> learn to share <laughs> um hello hey. hi um i find it um mind-blowing that it's taken you so long to write this book and from the age of 26 to 36 give or take from what i remember my ideals and viewpoints on the world myself life generally friends and family changed dramatically so I'm wondering how that might have influenced the way that you were writing with the, the characters, because uh, as much as we've understood that this was kind of just going along, there wasn't any set ideas to start with, I'm thinking, well, you're changing, so maybe the way you're writing these characters are changing, and did you have to go back and rewrite certain parts of the characters? That is such a good question. Um, yeah, I so at about year seven, it gets to be pretty embarrassing, you know. <laughs> like um, your friends ask you, like, "Are you still working on your novel?" You know, and 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 you, you, you know, yeah. So you're just like, uh, and so I kind of stopped talking about it. But but yes, definitely that happened. Um, uh, most obviously, it happened with the material that I wrote first. So the the stuff that I wrote about 2004, about uh, convention week 2004, um, I. I realized that I needed to fill out the story before I finished that section, and so I kind of left it for myself, and I went and wrote the whole book, and then finally, like seven, eight years later, came back to the material that started it all, and I read it, and I'm like, this sucks. This, I mean, this is the stuff that inspired the whole book, and it all went away, because I... It wasn't it, it wasn't good and and uh, and 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 more than that i had I had definitely changed it was very politically aggressive it was written by uh, a young man who thought he had all the answers and like that's not me anymore you know <laughs> like uh, uh life has a way of kind of humbling you and like chilling you out a little bit so um uh yeah so i had to i had to rewrite that completely and and then i i got to the stuff that i i had written next and i'm like oh this isn't quite right either so i felt i i felt suddenly worried that it would be like i'd be like the snake eating its own tail forever you know like always revising the book and never quite finishing it um uh i and so i i, I revised the book in a big blitz uh in, in the last year i was i was working on it um and and, uh, and and I mean the result of like the way the way I write is that the first draft was like a little more than a thousand pages long and I, I was able to cut back like 200 250 very easily because just a lot of stuff just just wasn't right anymore it just wasn't me um, and uh, yeah so um, I, but I'm thankful for that though like had had I written this book for like in one or two years when I was 28 like it would have been a radically different book and I think it wouldn't wouldn't have been as good anymore. Question. Yeah. 
Uh, hi. hi. Um, so when I read the book, I felt like uh, Samuel Argent was like uh, the author of a uh, choose your own adventure because he has the end. He gives you choice, but he has already the end. Did you have that in mind when you chose that to talk so much about uh, choose your own adventure? You mean about the ending? Yes, about the uh, like he feel like the like the author of a uh, choose your own adventure book that he put uh, Samuel and uh, his mother into. Yeah, abs absolutely. I act I had I had a I had an ending in mind two or three years before I got to it. I was like, oh, oh, I get it. This is where I'm going. And then I and then I wrote to it and I wrote that ending, and and I hated it. You know, <laughs> and and what had happened in those two or three years again, kind of getting back to your question, is that the story had sort of changed underneath me, um, and so I had to kind of reevaluate. And I realized that um, that I I couldn't I couldn't have an ending that closed down the story. Um, I wanted to have a satisfying ending, but I also needed an ending where uh, the characters were given a choice. You know, um, and that's that. That choice needed to be what what where where the book ended, you know, because so much of the so much of the story is about it. So I I kind of offer I kind of offer my characters a crossroads at the end of the book, and then it's kind of your guess whether they're gonna which way they're gonna go. Um, I, I I will say I wanted to after a 620 page book I wanted to write a really satisfying ending. I know people hate it when they're like, but what happened to you know? So I wanted to I wanted to close down the story, but I, but I wanted to leave at least Faye and Samuel with this kind of option of like what's gonna happen to their relationship now. So so yeah, I was thinking about that quite a lot. Okay, uh, hey, which is good. Hello. Um, could you please explain where the, the whole idea of Norway came from? Because you, you give quite a lot of description of the Norwegian island and then just the whole background. Yeah, my uh, mother's family uh, came from Norway a couple generations back. Uh, they moved from Norway to a small town in Minnesota in the U.S. and then and then stayed in Minnesota for a, a decade or two and then ended up moving the whole family to eastern Iowa, which is where that side of the family, most of them still live. Um, and uh, it was a place that I would go to visit. Iowa was a place that I would go to visit, for, uh, you know, most summers. Um, there, there were farmers. And... Uh, um, the thing is we don't know anything about the Norwegian side of the family like we just lost contact completely so I have no um, uh, there's no paper trail there's no, nothing and uh, and apparently my what is it my great great grandfather never talked about it um, why he left uh, and uh, and we only know like my mother remembers her grandmother saying that he was from Hammerfest Norway which I didn't I knew nothing about it meant nothing to me until I finally googled it one day and found that it was the uh, the northernmost city in the world um, it had this extraordinary uh, history this post-world war II history um, and so when I got to writing this book and I decided I was going to have Faye's father uh, uh, be an immigrant from Norway suddenly it was like an opportunity for me to fill in a part of my family history that is absent um i don't know what happened to him back there but i got to kind of make it up for the book um and uh and that's also why a lot of those norwegian folk tales show up in the book too because they were just kind of part of my my own heritage okay did you find it difficult to get into the head of a woman as opposed to a man and uh, especially one who abandons her quite young son. I mean, you researched a lot of other things. Did you have to research it, or did it come intuitively, or what? Uh, I don't know about intuitively. I, uh, I think... I think yeah. As soon as you you start writing from from a character who is not you, is not and you know, um, you're you're increasing the difficulty level in yourself. Um, and I think. I think the key to to writing from from any point of view that's not your own is to is to respect the character enough that you allow the character to move and grow and develop as you think they should and not not be a kind of widget for your storytelling you know um uh, uh i couldn't have Faye. uh um, I, I guess I had to earn that she would want to leave her family. I couldn't just have that happen and just make the reader accept it. I had to kind of get like dig into it, you know. Um, and that's a really, really long time, um, years, I think, uh, to be able to to get that in a way that it was satisfying to me. Um, and the crazy thing is that I, ha I have I have an aunt. Um, this isn't giving away any secrets because I have many, many, many uncles and aunts. I've come from a very large <laughs> Iowa farm family on both sides, so you won't be able to track down this person but I have an aunt who uh, contacted me after she read the book and she said uh, I just wanted to thank you for making Faye such a sympathetic character and I was like oh you're, you're welcome you know <laughs> you know and then uh, when I saw her uh, on my book tour and she came to one of my readings and we went out for drinks afterwards she's like yeah I did that 
I was like, well, well, what do you mean? She's like, I, I have, I have another family. Um, and I left them when they were children and nobody knows that. Uh, I was like, really? <laughs> and, uh, and, and apparently her husband knew and that was it. Um, and, uh, and she's just like, thank you for making her sympathetic. Thank you. You know, because somebody who does that has their reasons. They're not just evil. And so that I was very interested in her story, but also very thankful that she, she, she felt that way. I th- felt, felt like I did my job. Wow. <laughs> um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. If there's anybody, uh, we'll have this little, we'll just get a microphone to use. So can hear. Hi, I was wondering, what was the process of getting your book published? Yeah, so I um I, I had an agent uh because uh at some point when I was I was in Florida, um I I read a book uh by this woman named uh, uh Susanna Daniel and it was a book it was a novel called Stiltsville and it took place in Florida, it took base place in Key Biscayne. And I mostly read it because it was a local kind of Florida book and I loved it. It was uh, uh, it's it's a good book if anybody can find it Stiltsville, it's very good. Um and so I looked in the back of the um of the of the book, the acknowledgments to find out who the agent of this writer was because I thought I was hope I was hoping to do something similar with with my book. Um with that was she was doing with between her characters. And I, and so I found the agent and I emailed her like one short story that I had written a long time ago. I was like, "Hey, I read Stiltsville. I loved it." Um, here's a short story of mine. I hope you like it. And she wrote back. She's like, yeah, I liked it. Send me more stuff. So I had a, a few other short stories, um, stuff that had been published and had not, I had not lost in the loss of my computer. <laughs> um, and so I sent them uh, to her. And unbelievably, she said, okay, these, these are great. I'll represent you. Uh, and, uh, and she said, are you working on a novel? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have it to you really quickly. And then five <laughs> years went by. <laughs> I like I I'm not kidding I would I would send her an email annually I was like hi it's Nathan I'm still I still exist I'm still working on a novel I'll get it to you as quickly as I could and then she would write back like no problem just whenever it's ready uh she it's amazing she she had there's no reason she needed to wait wait that long for me but she did um and then one day I just dropped this like 800 page manuscript on her I was just like here you go done <laughs> um and she was great she was incredibly enthusiastic about it um she uh we went I went through two revisions with her before it even went out to to editors just kind of um cutting stuff that needed to be cut and like kind of mm, tinkering with a few characters and a few chapters um and then she she sent it out to to editors and like two three days later i got a phone i started getting phone calls from editors um who had read it already um three days later you know and um i was looking at the traffic on my website it was like zero 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 and then (laughs) <laughs> and like it, it had gone out in the grapevine, I had been told, which was weird. Um, and this editor, Tim O'Connell at Knopf, called me, and we talked um, for an hour and a half. The first forty-five minutes, we just talked about other things, poetry and food, you know. Like, um, and then he started talking about the manuscript, and I couldn't believe in he had read it in a day and a half. I couldn't believe how much he understood its bones. Like, he really got it. Um, and I knew that the book needed editing. I knew that I had some motivation problems in the middle that I didn't know how to solve, and I needed somebody else to help me. Um, and he had some good ideas about about how to do that. And uh, so I was really hoping. Off would buy the book, and then, and then two days later, they made an offer and we accepted it. So, like, it took like f- it, five years after I got the agent, <laughs> ten years to write the book, but after it went out, it sold in like a week. So that was a, that was amazing. That was a dizzying contrast, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, it was a great week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I guess so. Just just to finish, so now because uh, we were talking earlier, and you said this is the essentially the final stop on your next book tour, which has been going on for about what a year and a half. Yeah, now? about a year and a half. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's out in how many languages? Or um, it, it, I, I'm not sure how many it's out in now. I'd have to go back, but it's it, it will be out in 30 languages total. Mm. Okay. Um, and the the French language edition came out very recently too mm. if you're interested um and uh yeah so this is this is it mm. i've been this is i've been touring for about a year and a half and uh and uh and this is my last event on my mm. book tour well, my wife gets me back on friday <laughs> you know so so she's very excited about that I, as am i you know mm. and so <laughs> and so therefore my final question and you're perfectly entitled to veto this if you want <laughs> What next? Uh, Are you getting back to writing immediately? Are you going to give yourself a bit of a break? I, um... 
Uh, another ten, <laughs> another ten years. Yeah. Um, uh, the next book has been quietly marinating in my head for mm. like the last year and a half. So I have some, I have some characters that I, I, um, I like. I have a setting that I really mm. like, and so I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to to get to that. But most immediately, um, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's Hollywood stuff to do. Mm. So uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so we have, um, we have J.J. Uh, Abrams and Meryl Streep making this into a tv show um so i'm yeah a tv show uh limited series um so uh uh and narrow streep is fake right um so i'm i'm off to i'm off i'm off to los angeles in november for a little Mm -hmm. while to help out with that and uh hopefully hopefully we'll find a network i'm not sure where Mm -hmm. it's going to land yet but so that's most immediately is that and Uh, then and then the next book after that hopefully okay yeah well what a note to leave it on Um, well as, as always, the evening isn't quite finished. Um, we have stacks and stacks of the Knicks at, uh, at the till. Um, I'm sure Nathan will be happy to sign some for you. As always, we're going to be serving wine, so do stick around. Uh, continue the conversation with, with Nathan, with each other. Um, and please just join me one more time in giving it up for Nathan Hill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I should... I should say that the first the first time I ever visited Paris, which was like uh, nine or ten years ago now, like this was the first place I came to, I, you know, to 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 Shakespeare and Company. And uh, I remember seeing some like a, a college friend of mine. He he's one of those writers who produces a book all the time. You know, it's like no problem for him. He's like genetically modified corn. He just like keeps producing. You know, um, and I saw one of his books on the shelf, and I was like, I just felt bolts of jealousy. And, and so this is really really awesome. So thanks for everybody for coming. Yeah. <laughs>